Hello there and welcome to the Value of Everything. I'm pleased to have Michael Acuna with me. We're just going to go through a few topics which are happening in the news at this moment or happening in our day-to-day lives. So welcome back to the show, Michael. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you having me back. All right. So um, we've got to cover Charlottesville because that's been all over the news and um, it's been all over YouTube as well. So I just want to get your take on what 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 happened with those clashes. Yeah, um, that's an interesting phenomena that recently materialized. Um, it seems to me that the alt right um, is getting a little more uh, unconventional with their where they want to have the locus of their struggle. So now it's over historical monuments that, and I. For the most part, I think that it's relatively innocuous to have civil war monuments of the Confederacy. I I understand how it can be construed as insensitive to the descendants of some of the people who were on the other side of the conflict. Um, But it seemed to me that uh, it, it was unnecessary for it to escalate to the extent that it did. Um, But it was almost inevitable once Antifa became involved, that's pretty much their modus operandi is to uh, escalate things to the point of violence. But but the alt-right went there prepared to get into it with them. It wasn't one-sided. They knew that they would provoke a reaction like that. Yeah, I think it's like um, the mixture of symbolism there with a, a statue, which symbolism, like it's like going back to like an ancient time where we're, worship him uh, some kind of statue or like pyramid back then you got government bullshit where they're organizing like the right to assemble and they're rejecting people in certain places and rejecting in other places so central planning just went to, to pot there really they didn't quite understand it a lot of heated inf- um, emotion i noticed like like the, there's a lot of crowds and like the especially like Maybe the the more white supremacist uh, elements were saying like white lives matter, white lives matter. Oh, I mean, a lot of gen- like general mainstream people would say that as well. And then, um, and then you've got like that one single incident of the the car smashing into like the, uh, the people who were calling it the, uh, the the alt left and stuff. Um, I think there's like a mixture between whether that was actually it could have been an an, an accident in a cer- certain sense. I know that if somebody smashed at the back of my car. Oh, that would infuriate me. Um, it wouldn't necessarily mean that I'd plough straight into them, but like in a crazy crowded area, some accidents can happen like that. If your nerves get to you, your flight and um, fight or flight mechanisms kick in, you can do kind of crazy things like that. So I wouldn't possibly rule it out like it's just some crazy man who wants to just plough into people. But at the same time, that that could happen. Also, it could be like if if you want to raise tensions between the two that person could be paid for. I'm not ruling out that possibility either. And then the terminology of alt-left, alt-right. Why is everything alt-left and alt-right as well? Like, there, there is... is it, That just um, adds fuel to the flame. Um, and then... I, I mean, I've, how was your opinion of, uh, like, Donald Trump's reaction to that as well when he spoke afterwards? Did you hear that interview? Because I thought it was pretty poignant i mean obviously he had to keep on saying fake news and i think there's like uh th- there's a balance between the two but i know the the media didn't like it as much they said oh you're representing the the right wingers the alt rights too much there yeah um i mean i think that his response it wasn't it wasn't eloquent or statesman like but i mean he was trying to be measured in his reaction he Obviously, he doesn't want to alienate the entirety of the alt-right because a lot of those people were some of his most enthusiastic supporters and remain so. And um, he didn't want to alienate them by categorically condemning them. I think that was deliberate on his part. However, um, I mean, he he expressed uh, remorse over what transpired he was trying to be um trying to be neutral in the matter but i mean we're living in an age where you can't be neutral to these sort of topics it's a very stark 
black and white issue to a lot yeah. of people. And, and it, it seemed like the the old Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump, the uh, the pre-election uh, Donald Trump came out there. I mean, he's like he's really pissed me off in a lot of ways where he's said, right, let's put more armaments into um, Afghanistan, let's get in more entrenched in a like ten year plus war. That's such a load of bullshit. I mean, like, what is the point of that by by any means? He was totally on the opposite side. So uh, it sounds like the military industrial complexes, he's sided with them in to some degree because I can't understand any other reason why you would want to get involved in that war for any longer. Yeah, that's right. He's, he's really starting to uh, backtrack on all of his campaign promises. And one of the the symptoms of this is just seeing how his cabinet has changed so drastically since he came into office. Like the dismissal of Steve Bannon, that was huge. Bannon was one of the core um, members of his cabinet that were interested in more of the economic nationalism that Trump ran on. That was, that was the crux of his populism for a lot of people. And once he got rid of Bannon, that sort of signified that his cabinet's going to be filled with conventional neoliberal Republicans um, who are going to are going to side with a more neocon foreign policy and enact the same sort of economic programs the Republican Party at large was in favor of. And, you know, I, I always suspected that Trump was going to eventually acquiesce to the um, the bourgeois interests that can that dominate American politics. It was just a matter of time. Like the things that he was promising to do were just not congruent with the imperatives of capital accumulation and the bourgeoisie's class interest. Yeah. So, I mean, they were pissed off at Trump for a while because he was being pretty recalcitrant in a lot of his, uh, his rhetoric, but he eventually he's he's acquiescing where it matters, and um, I mean it'll be interesting to see the fallout from all of this with his supporters. I mean, we ha- where is his border wall? Where are these jobs and where are these uh, economic sanctions against China? Uh, none of this has come to pass, yeah. and now that he's sending more troops into Afghanistan, I mean that's pretty revealing in its own yeah. right. That, that doesn't piss me off as much because I know that government is just like a complete shit show you can't get much done and you're always going to get the senate uh, rejecting you for all those kind of things but just like the, the he's, he's f- fired the missiles um, in syria let that one go off then he's gone, gone and uh, entrenched himself into an afghanistan war he's yep. um, talks to North Korea and says fire and fury it's all that kind of bullshit and i know he's he's sided with something it's not he was he was actually like we should get our troops out of there there's no means we're, we're, we're being like the the policeman of um the the globe there's no reason to be that bum and then for some reason he switched his tune and it's it, all the actions are being shown there and it goes all against his words and that's where i'm judging the man he's just he's wrong in in every sense there no like the the press what do they want to talk about they want to talk about bloody left and right and identity politics and it's irrelevant it's irrelevant what well, the the wars are more important than all this bullshit yeah that's right and but look where the story is the story isn't on him sending more troops into afghanistan everything is surrounding his reaction to the charlottesville incident and i mean that's that's just part of the spectacle of late capitalism as far as i'm concerned like this is all just bread and circuses and nobody's really concentrating where it matters at, at least in terms of what the media is is covering yeah now uh, obviously charlottesville it, again that kind of thing could be swept up in the news and hidden away sometimes couldn't it i don't know like maybe the scale of it was a bit too big to be hidden away but sometimes i'm sure organizations of right wingers and stuff and little clashes with it, antifa that's always been in the news and it's sort of hidden away here and there and you don't quite hear about the right wing as much. But for some reason, this really gathered a lot of lot of pace. It's like, do you think there's significant markers in the size and scale of it? Or, or do you think maybe this has really blown up in, a me- like in the media sense? I mean, quantitatively, it's somewhat bigger than a lot of previous like neo-Nazi rallies or what have you. This, this sort of thing's been going on 
for ages yeah. now. Like Antifa and fascists have been fighting in the streets every year for decades. Yeah. Um, so that's nothing new. I think that the source of the their discontent, the Civil War monuments, that sort of that was interesting. That was unique. That wasn't something that was previously a terrain of struggle. So that made this uh, uh, a unique news item. And also the fact that Trump is such a polarizing figure and a lot of these guys explicitly endorse Trump also made this newsworthy and, and sensational. Yeah. So if you could, I mean, they've already tried to associate Trump with fascism and reactionary politics from the outset. But when you have literal neo-Nazis and Klansmen that are celebrating Donald Trump, that's going to obviously ga- um, gather a lot of attention from the public because previous administrations didn't have that sort of support from the fringes of the right wing. Like you didn't see neo-Nazis and Klansmen siding with George W. Bush or with uh, George Bush Sr. or Reagan, for that matter. Yeah. This is this is unique. Yeah, and I just see that this is, um, it's not necessarily a turning point in what events have happened in, before in the past, but because the media's latched onto it and gone, right, okay, any kind of like um, little kerfuffle between the right wing and the left wing, that's going to just blow up in the media straight away just to add fuel to the flames every time. Uh, so I, do you see that the Charlottesville is going to be just a one marker point or do you see more to come? There'll probably be further um, engagements that the media covers between the alt-right and uh, Antifa. Before this, you know, there was all of the campus um, struggle with uh, alt-right figures like Milo Yiannopoulos and yeah. shutting down speakers here and there. That was that was all over the media for a little while. Um, so I think that, you know, this is going to be an ongoing thing, but eventually fewer people are going to pay attention to it. They'll, it'll be desensitized and, you know, they'll move on to other stories. Yeah. But I, I mean... And the other thing I noticed is that, like, the, the term of or right or left. Now, I, you know, as a little funny thing here, I could almost class you as an all writer because you're very freedom of speech and freedom freedom of assembly and all that kind of stuff. So you're, you're quite, that's like, in, in a certain sense, a lot of the, you know, like, in today's modern age with libertarians and stuff, people would class you on that kind of side of scales. Um, anti-violence and things but then then you could say the left is more about identity politics and uh, emotions or anything else um, like in some ways it's big corporate uh, corporations how they sort of say okay you have to toe the line we have to employ more minorities more women and that's what the left is but it's nothing to do with it in, a, in when when you speak from its original terms. Yeah, it's ironic that values such as freedom of expression and association, which were solidly on the left um, just a few decades ago, now are associated with the alt-right. And the alt-right, as we all know, has fascistic and neo-Nazi elements. And if you study the history of fascism, you know there was no freedom of speech in Nazi Germany or fascist Italy. Um, I think that figures in the alt-right are cynically supporting freedom of speech because it's easy for them to posture as martyrs for those values. And the public, by la- um, in large measure, supports freedom of speech and association. So it makes them popular to posture as though they really care about this. When in reality, their political philosophies, at least, were starkly at odds with those Enlightenment principles. The left has deviated from them, and insofar as I'm concerned, are allying themselves with the very illiberal reactionary (laughs) views that the fascists employed and previous reactionary um, regimes. 
So it's it's sad that today someone like myself, who's on the uh, communist left, but who but who also is a proponent of these Enlightenment values, yeah, would be considered analogous to the alt right. I mean, it's it's a very <laughs> strange uh, state of affairs that has come to together. But um, but yeah, I mean. It's it's regrettable, and I think the left is doing itself a disservice by um, continuing to behave as it is. I have to just uh, step into one thing as well. The one thing I do notice with the right, and um, this, oh, I think there's a connection here with fascism as well, and it like I, it does make sense, and there is a logical argument to it as well. But then at the same time, it doesn't bode well with me. I always think that there's something something like um about if you've seen the movie of Gattaca and stuff about human will and how you can overcome thing overcome things so IQ they always say that the race connection to IQ and that that has a connection with fascism I think in the sense that fascism is obviously like survival of the fittest and uh, the well the, the the fittest person nowadays isn't necessarily physically fit because you've got forklift trucks and everything else is intelligence and there's this uh, connection between okay well the the whites are IQ 100 and then you've got the uh, Asians which are about 103 a little bit higher and stuff like that so that keeps them I always hear that keep on creeping into a lot of right-winger arguments and I'm not sure whether that's got connections to the fascistic movement or not how do you foresee that well prior to the second world war um, the theory of eugenics, yeah. uh, which is about selective breeding for desirable traits like IQ, that was ubiquitous on every side of the political spectrum. So there were fascist eugenicists, and there were even, a lot of people aren't aware of this, there were even Marxist eugenicists. Yeah. I was actually, I wrote a blog post about the race and IQ controversy, and I also intend on writing a paper on the history of communist eugenics. But um, in short, there is a connection, but I feel that a lot of what the fascists take from the race and IQ controversy are non sequiturs. So even if one were to posit that there was, there existed a uh, achievement gap. Yeah. Like there is an achievement gap between blacks and whites and it was genetic in origin which incidentally has not been determined by any means that's an ongoing controversy but let's just assume it were true um the conclusions that fascists and nazis draw from that are still illegitimate um because in order to come to the conclusions that they do that they do you have to make additional assumptions that one needn't make so Um, we all know that every individual, regardless of their race, differs in all manner of their behavioral characteristics and probably their, and, and their intelligence as well. Yeah. Now, what are the sources of those differences? I I think, and this is my opinion, but it's based off of literature I've read, empirical literature. I think part of it is genetic in origin, but if you study modern advancements in the study of intelligence and behavior. This The field of epigenetics has really turned this on its head in a way yeah. because the interaction of genes and environment make it almost impossible to parse out what percentage is biological in origin and what percentage is social. Yeah. So it's very difficult to parse that out. We're nowhere near getting to any definitive answers I, on the matter. I think it's but a fair, again, the fascists, yeah. yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think there's just like, there's a lot of spectrums to intelligence. There's like, one end, there's like uh, dyslexia, which that's, uh, that's something I have. There's, um, uh, what's the uh, what's the one that a lot of kids are getting nowadays? I can't even remember what it is. Uh, autism. Autism. It is more like detailed, focused on things into minute details. Um, that so that there's there's not like and both of those ends of the spectrum can get destroyed in like uh, in academia. IQ that are still sort of uh, they can get quite well represented. So that there's that 
end-to-end -end spectrum there, but I don't even think that's the end-to-end -end spectrum. Um, then you've got something like, say even if you're not the smartest kid in the school, but you get one kid that's just uh, pushed you to a side and he's got the girls and you're standing there jealous as hell. That can be the biggest fuel and flame of desire to really be a success in your life. And you don't even need to have a good IQ for that. You could just really work hard and be so determined to strive. So th there's like this human will, human desire and a matter of events and things can revolve from one time to another. You can be given with gifts, but the gifts never materialise because you never had to work hard. So that it's like it, that to say that one thing like IQ just represents everything. It's just I think it's just a, a very weak argument. It is. I mean, when you look at life outcomes, intelligence is just one component of whether or not people feel as though they led a fulfilling life. So just imagine someone like Stephen Hawking, for instance, he clearly has an IQ on the far right end of the uh, bell curve. Yeah. And nonetheless, he's crippled. Um, while his life, I'm sure, was fulfilling and full of achievement, to be sure, uh, he's been immobile for most of his life. And he, did, he probably, as a consequence, didn't have the same experiences and joy that a lot of able-bodied people with mediocre intellects had. Yeah. Um, think of someone who isn't intelligent, but is nonetheless very attractive to other people. Um, he's going to have life outcomes that differ from a unsightly person with a really high IQ. Yeah. Um, now, who's to say who had a better life? Well, that's now you're going to start smuggling in value judgments. And, um, you know, some people are athletic. Some people and then, and then aren't. We're not even discounting. This is the other thing. Would you, would you rather be on a desert island with a very a load of intelligent, like, nasty shit? Or would you rather be on a, a, a desert island with dumb people, but they're as lovely as hell? Well, lovely is, oh, that's exactly. probably the wrong word. But you, you'd love, you want to be on the, the, the thing which are always nice with, with you and stuff. Yeah, there's no way you would want to be right. with those those shits. They'll stab you in the back in a, in a number of seconds. So there's, a, there's <laughs> exactly. a question, there's a there's another question of like, all right, is intelligence the meaning of everything in life? Well, maybe not. We could be quite happy just living quite a peaceful, enjoyable life where everyone's friendly with each other. So... It, again, I always think that that IQ thing is a very one-dimensional argument at best. And then I think there's a little connection here to fascism. Fascism, obviously, is like the survival of the fittest. And I, I always, I, there's that, th that thing that little touches me a, a little bit. Where I goes, hmm, here we go. There's, there, there's that IQ thing again. Now, I, I've actually been IQ tested. I think I range about 110, 115. Um, like that, that's the, not the the website ones, the actual real ones. But I mean, even yeah. so, like I'm a little bit higher on the end of the spectrum, but it's not, it's not like I'm fantastically, I'm not in like the 130s or 140s by any means, but it just, it just shows. Another thing that I was thinking about is that say if that person was injured and they just read books for the rest of their lives and they only got an IQ of 80. Again, IQ is a representation, it seems to me, of puzzle connection and a little bit more of dot connection sometimes. But even if your dot connecting isn't that great, even, at, at, I don't know, an IQ sense of like, I don't know, a 90, surely you can just connect ideas fairly well anyway. Like, okay, I've been studying this book on botany and I've been studying this book on, I don't know, artificial intelligence and I can think of these two ideas together now and oh, this might work a well, I might test this out and see if it works. It's not, it's not necessarily the whole driver. I know that there is also this thing about, um, where they say that the, the most predeterminate thing about your life is your IQ and your emotional intelligence as well, and that will equate to your final outcome. I, 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 Predetermination really piss me off at the best of times, but it just, I don't know. You know I think um, that, yeah, that's pretty much what I've got to say of it anyway. Sure. Um, I mean, we have to be very realistic about what IQ is to the extent we have any idea. We do know that it's measuring intelligence as certain people define it. The question is, what is the source of IQ? Is it really heredity or is it environmental or some 
mixture of the two. I, I personally think the empirical evidence um, points in the direction of it being an interaction of one's uh, genetic endowment and the environment they're born into. And as a result of the dialectical interaction between genes and environment, it's very difficult to parse out where one ends and the other begins. Yeah. Um, maybe the distribution's 50-50, maybe not. We, we just, we don't know, and it's possible we may never know. If you look at twin studies that are already method, uh, methodologically suspect, they come up with estimates at 80%, but again, you can really poke holes in all of that, and it unravels rather quickly. Yeah. So honest, the, the honest position is we just don't know. And... Um, the hereditarians, obviously, they, they're going to go with the higher end estimates. Um, but the biggest controversy around IQ has always been the racial achievement gap. So, the, And that's what you'll he hear right-wingers cite a lot in debates. They're, they're going to point out the black-white IQ gap, which is, I think, one standard deviation apart. So yeah. um, whites have, I think, 15 points higher on average than black people do. But um, but again, what is IQ really measuring? It's it's measuring intelligence, sure, um, and that's gonna have that's directly gonna bear on what one can comprehend yeah. um, when one is studying or examining things. But, one mean, of the things yeah. that uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, go go for it. Uh, well, j just to quickly think as well is that nobody really works this one out. Curiosity, like you could be intelligent as hell, but if you're not curious and you're just playing. I don't know, those little computer games on your mobile all the time and you play whatever, those gem games and stuff. You're never going to find anything. You're never going to utilize that brain. However, if you, you're you a little bit, I don't know, you're a little bit on the other end of the spectrum and you're curious, that that means a lot more than the IQ. So again, I don't know, unless there is a direct connection to, between the IQ and curiosity, but I, I doubt that again as well. There may be, but... I mean, children are very curious, and they don't—they haven't developed um, their IQs yet. So, I mean, they're—I mean, they—they they obviously have an IQ, but it's not fully their intelligence isn't fully expressed while they're still developing. But, but in any event, you're right. Like, it's—it's it's more than just the raw potential. It's what you make of it, what you make of what you're endowed with. Yeah, and uh, that's going to have a crucial impact on your life outcomes for sure. Uh, I just think that. When it comes to the right and their use of IQ studies, it's very, um, it's cynical, um, it's controversial, it, it doesn't logically follow, um, and it doesn't in any way lend credibility to their political philosophies. That's taking a leap that the data itself just doesn't justify. Yeah. But nonetheless, you'll see them constantly cited. Yeah. Now, just just to keep it on the, um, the Charlottesville uh, situation. Do you think that there, these events mirror any time in history? A lot of people are trying to draw parallels with, you know, Charlottesville and the recent clashes between Antifa and the alt right, and they're trying to juxtapose it with Weimar Germany. Yeah. You know, before the ascent of uh, the Nazi Party, right around that period. I don't see that. I think that's really overstating the case. I don't think that actual fascistic sympathies or even far right wing sympathies, I don't think they're ascending. I think that people that were at the Charlottesville rally, the white nationalists, you know, I, they're statistically insignificant and will remain so. There's not some mass resurgent uh, fascism in the United States. I don't see it. There's... There's no sign of it, honestly. Uh, these groups have always existed on the fringes, and th they will continue to exist. They might always exist, for all I know. But I'm, I'm not seeing, you know, the drastic, troublesome signs that a lot of people are seeing. I, I do think that nationalistic sympathies are on the rise. Yeah. But that's that's distinct from what we're observing in Charlottesville. Like I'm not seeing white nationalism being particularly uh um popular at least in the United States. Now Europe is another matter altogether. I think in Europe 
you are seeing a rise of ethnic nationalism. Um, and that has to do with um, the refugee crisis and immigration. But in the United States, it's not nearly as as drastic as it is there. Yeah. Um, so I want to just go over to... Um uh, uh, and now I think it's probably just good to just uh, whack onto the economy because I think it's uh, good to get an idea of what's going on. Now, I d- one of the significant things out of everything, everything's really quiet in the financial markets, it seems. Everything's like the calm before the storm, if, if I find it. And if we ever look at the, the point in time in history, it's always like the fall of or the, the autumn of the year where all the financial crises happen happen it's been 10 years since the 2007 crisis uh, 2008 it really sort of spilled out um you've got bitcoin which is marching way up into the four thousand dollars mark you've it seems like there's a lot of car auto loans in america australia is just a a, a joke case where you, to buy a house you've got to be a, a multi-millionaire and um it's just a tax. the 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 weird the weirdness of Australia just defies me in a way. But then you've got, yeah, just what's your economic um, outlook to what's happening over the next two years? I mean, things have been remarkably stable in the markets given the geopolitical yeah. happenings and also just the the data that we're seeing out of a lot of. Um, Fortune 500 and major corporate profit returns. Um, it's it's almost as if uh, it has it hasn't registered that yet. Um, over the next couple of years, I suspect that the uh, the ongoing situation and by which I mean a, a decline in the rate of profit is going to eventually trigger another recession. I think that. Sorry, to interrupt there. Um, do, do you think in the um, like the car auto loans in America, that's like a, that's another subprime crisis in itself, because that's all just repackaged um, loans to investors seeking yield uh, when they they can't pay off these loans and they uh, default on their loans, then they realise that they've been just sold a load of junk, and then that starts to crash again and sends uh, signals off into the, into the financial market. China's over leveraged to, to the max. They're, the government's just working out one way how to, they can expand the economy. They've done infrastructure, infrastructure spending. The The entire mindset and of the people is the only way to make riches is in real estate. And that's spilling off into like, well, well on the Eastern seaboard of um, Australia and um You've got the uh, like uh, Toronto and uh, places like that from China's perspective, or London. Anything that you can find in a shopping bag is uh, those lo- uh, like those fancy uh, stylish locations. New York, they're all getting inflated in prices. Maybe New York's not so much now, but London is. Uh, and also, China's got capital controls. I find China's quite a significant player nowadays. It's not necessarily all about America. Um, so they're leveraging up the market. Um, people, there's been warnings from the IMF recently to China to say that they're they're leveraging up. Just like nothing really seems that safe, but it's just very calm on every front. But Bitcoin, at the same time, everyone seems to p- be piling into that. That could be a speculative bubble. I'm not suggesting that that's just a, a market of riches. There's always a mechanism way where cryptocurrency can be, cryptography can be unraveled if there is a fast enough computer out there. There's just there's just all these different little things which are manoeuvring in the background. Where do you see like um like the the economy of America? I don't, I don't see any of like Trump's um, big spending plans that are going to come into fruition either. No, I don't think so. There, I mean, there's a partisan struggle over all of that in yeah. Congress, and, and it's going to be difficult for him to enact anything. But honestly, uh, I do. If you if you examine the rate of private household debt, it has skyrocketed. Like the American economy is living off of debt, as yeah. you are alluding well, to. Well, Australia is oh. double. I reckon we're double. Well, not double you, but just with mm-hmm. um, our uh, bit, something like two dollars of debts out there for the uh, productivity, the GDP, uh, one dollar right. of GDP. So it's crazy. And that's indicative of how sluggish the economy itself is, because yeah. if 
if we were really doing so well, incomes would be rising and you'd have higher rates of economic growth. But yeah. we don't see that. So um, this is going to catch up eventually. This can't go on perpetually as it is. Yeah, and uh, like uh, this, probably this argument will probably uh, bode well with you. But do you feel like um, I think it's even like in the 1970s or something? It was really up to the business owners to have maybe a financial crisis or have um, pay the workers more money for the jobs that they're doing, or saddle them with debt. And I think from 70s onwards, um, they've just decided, okay, well, we'll just give them more debt, more debt, more debt. And every time you get a little splurge where the, the debt becomes too much and then that rebalances the economy. But it just seems like debt's the only way to go. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of controversy surrounding what happened in the 70s and what happened with uh, real wages. Like there's a big controversy among Marxists, for instance, as to whether or not labor share of the product increased or de decreased during the 70s. But what did undisputably happen in the 70s was um, for a while, the balance of class powers were such that labor had better bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis capital. So higher wages had to be paid for a period. Um, there was higher rates of unionization and the labor market was such that it privileged labor for a little bit. Yeah. And what happened was a period of stagflation. So because so much of the, prop, of the profit companies were making were going to um, wages for labor, a lot of, there was less investment in, in firms because yeah. the rate of return had declined. And then since there was more money amongst consumers, inflation started to ensue. So you had a serious situation where unemployment and inflation were both simultaneously rising. And then you had a correction. So you had the, uh, the ascendancy of right-wing presidents like Reagan, um, who... He didn't smash the unions necessarily. I mean, that that's what he's often associated with. But there's only a few instances where he really went after them. Rates of unionization started declining since then on their own, irrespective of Reagan. But I mean, he instituted a number of neoliberal policies that favored capital. And that got us back onto a trajectory of economic growth. I say this as a Marxist. Again, I'm not trying to... Uh, to uh, praise Reagan or anything, I think that it's it's regrettable, but that's how capitalism functions. Yeah. If you have a healthy rate of profit, you're going to have higher employment and greater rates of economic growth. Um, that's just a fact. And uh, you did see a restoration of that under those uh, regimes. I'm just going to move you on to just one, one theory. I just think that's very interesting. You know um, Steve Keen's theory of um, debt forgiveness or debt jubilee? How effective, that, well, I would say, would a Marxist see that principle made? So you, rather than paying off the bankers and giving them extra liquidity, you can allow the banks to, um, well, you, you can pretty much uh, make them, uh, the, the government can pretty much uh, secure all the, the accounts so nobody really loses their money. And then you give everybody a credit, um, if you've got a debt, you must reduce that debt, and then anybody else who hasn't got a debt, they get um, a credit boost at the same time. So the debt no longer becomes unsustainable, and if you think about times like uh, Japan or Germany after the war, rather than like the Versailles Treatment where they had to add debt reparations, you instead have um, quite a booming economy after the, um, World War Two for both of those sides. So. Yeah. How would a Marxist view that policy? Um, there's there's a few ways that uh, a Marxist like myself would view it. I think sociologically and politically it would be destabilizing because there'd be a significant moral hazard to follow from it. Um, and also it would really distort financial markets because let's just posit that one were to have a debt jubilee. Um, financiers would be very reluctant to start 
lending again afterwards because once the public realizes that that's a political option, um, within a number of years, they could always opt to put into office uh, politicians that are promising another debt jubilee, even when it isn't necessarily warranted. So that would... What about, let's just say, for example, then the market prices that? Let's just say, okay, well, um, this debt could become worthless in, say, I don't know, let's just say 20 years' time if everybody's too indebted. Couldn't the market just price it and just say, okay, well, because of that, we're going to have to start raising interest rates. So uh, instead of this 1% bullshit, you're going to have to charge uh, 20% because this could get forgiven at some point. It's like an insurance system. Could it work like that a little bit? Yeah, it could. But then let's think of the consequences that could follow from that. Um, you could have a decrease in um, aggregate demand. Yeah. Um, you would have a decrease in uh, business loans. Um, you would, you'd start seeing sluggish economic growth as yeah. a consequence of that. And that would lead to higher unemployment and all manner of things. Um, so there's that. At the same time, though, you could say that you, um, let's just say, for example, a lot of the debts have been forgiven and there's a lot of savings. So people have got money to spend or they can just t decide to use it to put in back to bank accounts or whatever. And because there is that attractive yield of 20%, people decide to put all their money in the bank accounts. And then there's a lot of money trying to seek out um, to find uh, good business ventures. And there isn't enough good business ventures because the, in the interest rate is so high. So then there's so much savings there that they have to um, go lower the interest rate just to find that investor in that sense. I mean, it like uh, there is that kind of idea of rebalancing the economy in that sense as well. Yeah, I suppose that, that could be an outcome that could sort of counteract the tendency that I was citing. Uh, I'm, I'm honestly agnostic as to how that would work out. I just know that financial institutions would be distorted as a consequence of a jubilee being a feasible yeah, option. I think yeah. They would be petrified about that. I think that politically that would be um, very dangerous. Um, and from an economic perspective, um, a macroeconomic perspective, I don't think a debt jubilee is going to address our economic crisis because I don't think that the source of the crisis is debt. Um, as Steve Keen, who's a Minskyan, yeah. feels. Um, I, as a Marxist, the locus of economic crises, in my opinion, have to do with the rate of profit. We, you, you and I have discussed this in the past, um, but basically, I believe that every major economic crisis ultimately stems from a secular decline in the rate of profit um, to capital. So um, the only way to address that is to have mass destruction of capital. So just liquidate firms that are no longer registering a profit. We'd have to have a major correction to get back to restore the the profitability of of capital. Right. So, um, short of that, nothing's going to get us out of the crisis. You need to have a mass, uh, a period of mass business closures, um, and that that is also destabilizing and potentially dangerous. And that's why politicians never want to exercise that option because they know that. When that happens, you have mass unemployment and anything can follow from that. So they always uh, try the Keynesian route of stimulus and kick the can down the road. So I'm just in intrigued on this one. So say like the 1930s um, depression, how, how was it that, because obviously, let's just say there was a, a reduction in profitability of all the business firms um, leading up to the, the end of the 1920s, how did that, like obviously that collapsed because the of the search of, um, for profit yield that that destroyed the um the, the the economy how did it end up covering itself well in my estimation and there's a lot there's not a lot of good statistics that were saved during that period a lot of the government just wasn't keeping track of 
rates of profit the way they do today. Yeah. The, the means by which to do so were, wasn't there. So this is all based off of fragments of what the government was keeping track of. But from what Marxists were able to piece together that examined it, the Second World War is what essentially got the United States out of the economic crisis. And the Second World War happened to entail a lot of capital destruction. We leveled most of Western and Eastern Europe and the Far East. So China, Japan, Germany, France, all of those countries were decimated. And um, the United States, as it happens, wasn't. And we became the chief manufacturing base of the world economy at that point. So that restored the United States rate of profit. And then we started to engage in uh, the Marshall Plan and helping to rebuild the economies of Europe and the Far East. And that process, the Bretton Woods system, for instance, uh, was a way of managing um, American supply and demand in a way that was uh, that privileged us and we were able to recover. Um, our profitability soared during the post-war era. And that led to what they call the golden age of American capitalism, where you had high rates of employment, uh, rising real wages. Um, whereas in Europe, a lot of the achievements that the working class made were a result of government intervention and social democracy. So there are a lot of redistributive schemes that were introduced. And th- that. Um, so, and I'll give you another one that possibly could uh, uh, help your argument as well is, um, or assist with your argument, is the uh, addition of the women to the workforce. Yes, that also was a huge, huge um, stimulant to the economy because you had that much more labor and that much more demand. And we also had the suburbanization of the United States. Um, The automobile took off. All of that really stimulated growth in the United States and restored profitability for companies and particularly American companies because we didn't really have competitors at the time. Yeah. Um, and in the in in Europe, um, as I was saying, uh, social democracy really took off. That was because of the threat of the Soviet Union. They wanted to pacify their domestic working classes, so they acquiesced to a lot of um, redistributive policies. But in the United States, none of that was necessary. We didn't need to have social democracy because we had high rates of unionization, and we also had happened to be the world's chief manufacturer, as I said. So um, none of that was necessary. Most Americans had health care. Most Americans could pay their own way. They didn't need government intervention necessarily at that point, the way that the European working classes did. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's my that's my assessment yeah. anyway. And, and well, uh, the other side of the argument would say, OK, well, after the war, you, um, the Second World War, you you were actually funding... Uh, Britain's uh, Britain's war and uh, maybe even the Russians and uh, the well, the Germans to an initial extent and stuff like that. So um, th- as being a, a big debtor and all the debts in the 1930s, that could have been written off as well. So there is that debt argument on the sideline to the profitability argument. I mean, I, I'm, I reserve my judgment. I'm not necessarily going to make a, a, a step in one direction or the other. But I understand. I do understand the Marxist argument of the lack of profitability, the the continuous cycle for yield, 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 and then it just ends up. Um, th- there's this finite search for it, and then there's there's a, a, an eventual collapse. Um, but then, uh, the, the, let me just think off off of my head here. It's just with the profitability argument. Is isn't there like um. Isn't there a point where you can have a sustainable level of profitability or do you need to always go into further and further profit zones? I just just want to understand the motivation behind that. Well, I mean, one of the fundamental assumptions, it's almost axiomatic of Marxist economics, and I think it's a sensible one, is that capitalism exists for profit. Um, That's the driving force of capital. So... Anything that hinders that is going to destabilize the system because that's what it exists for. That's its raison d'etre is to augment value. Um, And you can see that in an empirical sense. You can even 
go into micro foundation. Say you own a, you know, some kind of a firm. Once you and not necessarily, let's say that you have partners or you have investors or, or even banks that are co- that are involved. Once anything interferes with your rate of profit, that's going to bear directly us on whether or not people are going to reinvest in that or yeah. seek more lucrative opportunities. So that's just you know one of the fu- fundamental um, axioms of Marxist analysis. Could, um, you, could you go so far? Sorry, could you go so far as to say that profitability? is a representation of production. Yeah, you can, absolutely. I mean, the source of profit in Marxist analysis is the surplus value that labor creates. Now that goes back to the labor theory of value and everything. We don't have to even make those assumptions yeah. to carry on okay. with what, what I was discussing. So, but so if we say, you wouldn't necessarily say that the rate of production is going to be limited though, would you? No, no, not at all. It's it's not static by any means. It's dynamic. So, um, yeah. you know, th- that has to do with um, developments in the forces of production. Yeah. So, um, so that's so, going to also I- influence this. So I understand with profitability, that's monetary. And depending on how many dollars are in circulation, there is this limitation of it. And how much debt there is in circulation, there is a limitation of profitability. But on the other side, there is uh, production, which potentially is limitless, in a sense. Am I am I right in making those two distinctions? Yeah, I suppose so. I mean, once we get into the production end of things, then the labor theory of value does start taking uh, start taking effect in our analysis, because once you have, it has to do with the ratio of constant to variable capital. And um, variable capital being the source of surplus value and therefore the source of profit. And yeah. then we get to um, crises or, or economic growth. But but when it comes to, say, an, you were referring to maybe an equilibrium rate of profit where things are stable um, and whether or not you need to have a constant rate of growth for yeah. capitalism. Yeah, I'm not sure whether I'm not sure whether that I was just thinking of it was on my head there. I was just trying to get an idea out there, but I think it really boiled down to production on that point. Um, no, but it's it's yeah. interesting because I, I think like not necessarily profit is the be all and end all because there is a component of debt in there as well. And if your yeah. if the theory of profitability includes debt, then I think I agree with the Marxists in a sense because they're, if you're piling in the debt system into the profitability margin at the same time and there is a certain circulation of uh, currency as well, then yeah, you're, you're, you're always going to find yourself in that vicious cycle. Right. It absolutely does take into account debt. I mean, that's that starts to bring to bear on finance capital and yeah. its share of the social product. Yeah. And so, yeah, we can't, we cannot take that out of the equation so if if the uh if the social product is starting to be consumed by um rates of debt that's also going to affect profitability to an extent but that can be corrected um through government action so uh i mean we we certainly take that into account when we're analyzing um profit yields and, and measuring that in our analyses. Gotcha. Um, now, uh, one of the um, professors I interviewed, uh, Richard Wolf, he, um, I noticed a few of his videos recently, he mentioned one of the things that he spoke to me about in uh, my interview about the shared economy. And he says that something like Uber is like the oldest scam in the book where uh, you get people to really find a new access to work um but there's like less things like insurance and uh all your safety nets in place which enables them to access a lot more work but then uh, and then sells the product cheaper to the um to the consumer or uh, customer um but then there's less safety nets so do you see that representation I understand where Richard Wolff is coming from. He makes this point often. Yeah. And it's a it's a legitimate criticism because uh, as Marxists we tend to prioritize the um the supply end of uh of the economy. So we're looking at 
conditions for working people as opposed to consumers. On the one hand, the sharing economy um, is great for consumers because it introduces more competition and drives prices down. Yeah. Um, on the other hand, while it gives more people more flexibility in the labor market, say I wanted to be an Uber driver, it's it's relatively easy for me to to start doing that. Yeah. I don't have to get licensed the way that a taxi cab driver did, for instance. Yeah. On the other hand, I don't have the same sort of protections that people traditionally involved in that line of work had. And also, you know, you're you're subject to the whims of the market more so you don't have that sort of barrier that that used to exist. So once you once you create barriers to entry for any profession, yeah. um, that's going to restrict the size of the labor market. Um, and that's going to give those workers a better bargaining position vis-a-vis -vis capital so they can demand higher wages or what have you. Yeah. Once you open up the labor market, yeah, you can start becoming involved in those lines of work yourself, but your conditions of labor aren't going to be as good as taxi drivers were or what have you. Yeah. And then there are consumer concerns. We can't neglect that. Like when you when you're talking about say um Airbnb or one of those services, I mean you're risking a lot more than you would if you were to go to a hotel or something where there's strict regulations of how those places are yeah, are managed yeah. run. Yeah. Um just on another Marxist site and, and speaking of your ideology you know, some places like Hong Kong, it's really easy to set up a business. And, and America, still to this day, it should be fairly easy to set up a business. And if you think about um, a lot of uh, more government-run economies, there, there's a lot more, uh, you, as you said, barriers to entry. You've got to get licenses and all that kind of stuff. How easy should it be for uh, uh, somebody to set up I know you shouldn't really quite say business but had to set up some kind of organization in a market in a Marxist's uh, economy well um, the method by which one were to open up a collective enterprise is going to be different from a capitalist market yeah. enterprise because um, you're taking into account more factors and Lenders, I shouldn't even say lenders, but those who are tasked with allocating investment resources, um, they're going to be a little more prudent in terms of what they, the criteria that they employ. So they're going to take into account factors that market economies generally don't. So they're going to start to take into a, a account potential externalities and the social cost of your your line of production yeah. or services. Um, whereas in a capitalist market economy, really the only criterion that the lender is looking at is what your rate of return is, how promising your idea yeah. is. Um, so I, I would imagine that market economies in general, even the most regulated of them, are probably going to be easier to set up a business because, again, they're, they're analyzing things differently. Because obviously you, you must think um, from a Marxist side, you must think, okay, well, there's, there's, there's that, that, that initial idea, like any idea that you might have or anything like that, it might just sound like an idiotic to a lot of people. But then eventually, if you can prove that, I don't know, you've got, a, I don't know, a dog washing company or whatever, and it actually works out quite well and stuff like that, and you, you've done it off your own back and your own debt, you, there, there is something to be said of that kind of market impetus. I, I always think about this. What was the time in uh, in the Russian revolutions where was it? Um, who was the guy who maybe just said like, oh, let the market play itself out for a little bit. Let the black market kick in so the economy can sort of drive from its grassroots from this point onwards. Yeah, th mm -hmm. There must be, I don't know, like from a, from a Marxist perspective, just that hum human will and drive ingenuity rather than to be so bureaucratic, like there, there must be some kind of way to open up that door. Sure. I mean, I think that when it comes to the ideas that people have, um, if, they're, if they're good ideas um, and they're something that consumers seem to be interested in, they should be a lot, like 
the idea of a communist economy isn't that the only firms that are going to be granted um, resources to operate are those that we know for a fact people want yeah. or need. Um, obviously, there's going to be experimentation. Um, and you sort of find out after the fact, just as in a market economy, there's experimentation. Most firms go out of business within the first five years. Um, that's just a fact of market economies. In a communist economy, I don't know if the, the rate of failure would be as high, but there's surely going to be cooperatives that o- opened up and they tried and consumers just didn't like what they were delivering yeah. and they would be would fail accordingly. So there, I, I don't want to convey the impression that communist economies are going to be so, I, I guess, dull and uninspired and um, not conducive to ingenuity and novel insights or anything like that. I, I, I would hope the opposite would be the case. And I think that yeah. there's reason to suspect. So I don't want, I don't want you to think that I support s- barriers that are just unreasonable. I think that the barriers that would be in place to the um, establishment of worker uh, collectives would be sensible ones, ones that we do need to take into account, safety, environmental fallout, those sort of factors. So like, not- the, the way, let me just say, like, a, a, let me just modernize that idea a little bit for you. So like, I could foresee something like uh, very more so web-based, people are just put, plugging in ideas, like I've got this idea for um, setting up a, a a business which is going to deliver food to your to to your doors and stuff like that, and people will like comply and go yes 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 that's got a, a local vote in the system in the local area and everyone's thinking this is a great idea. Then there's a selection process like it looks at the expertise in the area. Ah, oh, these people know about logistics and time management. Is this feasibility? They, 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 you know like the the common business attributions of whether there's a the risk reward ratios, all that kind of stuff that that gets um, systemized in in this like democratic voting pool and uh, working out the the resources in the area, and then after the vote comes back, they work out that this is, to get this kind of system up and running, you're looking at uh, your estimated um, cost is this. Do you want to still confirm that you want to have this in your area? Click yes, yes, and then then the next step goes on, and then maybe in in a year's time that system starts to come into fruition, and you get food delivered to your door. I don't know, like, could you see something more modernized like that? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, once you get into the actual practicality of how um, decentralized planning would work, that's very much what I envisage. So. Um, a lot of this would be done through networks like the internet and the planning facilitation board would offer feasibility estimates, a cost benefit ratio, those sort of things. And then they would decide whether or not um, allocating resources to that collective would be a worthwhile endeavor. But there's going to be, I mean, the the demand end of this is going to play a, a crucial role. So if if people genuinely like the idea an entrepreneur has in a communist society, then they're going to register that and um, the planning facilitation board is going to have to acquiesce. The, the, the reason why it's called a facilitation board is because they're not making the, the determination as to whether or not the, you know, these enterprises are going to exist. It's, it's going to be part of a negotiation between supply suppliers collectives of workers and then consumers they're the ones that are ultimately deciding one way or another the the planners are just facilitating the process and the planners themselves are elected to those positions so they're not going to go against the will of the masses on these issues they're not going to be you know exercising a lot of individual autonomy what they're going to do is just determine whether or not a particular business venture is feasible and whether or not the demand end really justifies the resource allocation. Yeah. And now another thing of, uh, of just like a, an argument is to say that uh, with like just a very small capitalism, like a, 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 what, not the crony capitalism we have now, but a real capitalism society, 
you you do have more so like um small failures small business failures so you you mentioned that before like there, there's going to be tons of little failures where the little ideas were tried out um even if you think about like the biggest companies in the world they always started off really from small grounds and then they built their way up their way up and until they ended up into these massive multinational corporations but um uh, the scalability the, with Marxism, and if you uh, uh, unless you're looking at really small communities that are doing these ideas, um, you're looking at very big uh, like ideas and industrial moves and all this kind of stuff from the onset, and it, like because you, these moves and this industrial move is so large, there's a massive heightened risk that that potentially could fail. Because you're, you're obviously you're investing a lot of ideas, a lot of people into that kind of idea, but it's like um, spray and pat pray on the capitalism side, and eventually something will come into fruition and eventually becomes good. And then on the other side, you've got Marxism is just fire a quality idea out there, and hopefully that works out, or you're going to just really that's going to destroy itself, and it's going to be a massive burden on the economy. Do you, do you see that idea, like that that theory? Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, and that there were a lot of issues associated with central planning that you could legitimately cite as problematic. So centrally planned economies were significantly less dynamic than market economies, to be sure, because what you have is a small board of planners that are trying to set out years in advance what the economy is going to entail. And, um, that st- comes comes with a whole host of problems in terms of the information that they're working with, um, the honesty of the participants on the lower end of things. Uh, council communism is predicated upon the notion of decentralized networks where things are done at a more local level and then it scales upward from there depending That's on good, supply yeah. chains and, and what have you. So... Yeah. Um, the issue of of scale is addressed through the nested council network. Gotcha. So um, I think that that would go a long way in, in addressing a lot of this. So so in communism, what I what I would say is, as opposed to what you observe in capitalism, where you have a lot of small businesses that fail, what you'll see in a communist planned economy. Um, a libertarian communist planned economy is you'll see a lot of ideas that never come to fruition. So there'll be plenty of proposals that people have, but they never materialize because the demand just wasn't there for them. Um, And so it's, it's analogous to a capitalist small business failures, except you have less waste because no one ever invests in them. Yeah. I gotcha, I gotcha. Yeah, no, that sounds, um, I, I think it's really important actually to define that council part, isn't it? It does. I, I, it is. For some reason, do you know, like, uh, you know the word council in the UK, it's out, do you know what the council means? It's just like the government yeah, body, like it's like a small, government. yeah, and you always, it's a, such a bad connotation to it, council. I don't know whether you can rebrand it as something else, but um, it's like, it's like, US- un, it's unit com- communism or something like that. I don't know, but like, council. Yeah, some people, <laughs> I mean, there's there's a tradition of so because councils have harkened back to the workers councils in yeah. central europe and in, in eastern europe that came to existence during the revolutions but in the uk in particular it has a negative connotation in the us it doesn't but if i were a communist in the in the united kingdom i would definitely rebrand myself <laughs> i would opt for something like i don't know a libertarian communism yeah. or something like yeah that. i definitely would go with that one um okay well that, that's um interesting um just another one that's um, coming up uh, recently, and it's a vote that's coming up in Australia, and I think there's um, stuff, uh, I'm not sure even what the situation is with America on this, but you know the um, the uh, the gay marriage vote? Now, uh, I mean, it, like, it doesn't really bother me too much, but do you find that there is a, there's a conflict of interest here between a government which is saying people will and have the right to, to marry and the government's going to step in but then on the other side, you've got the religious argument of we should choose in our own religion what we can do and what we can't do. It shouldn't be the, the role of the government to step in and say, well, you should be marrying those people opposed to those people. Do you think there is a um, 
Do you think this ruling of gay marriage is a little bit of the government stepping in into a matter that it shouldn't do? I know it's a, a marriage is becoming a more of a government institution, but I just want to get your opinion of that. Well, I'm a, I'm a classical Marxist when it comes to the issue of marriage and that I don't believe that the state should be involved in it, period. Yeah. Um, I don't think that there should be marriage licenses. I, I think that the marriage ceremony is nice, and I think that people committing themselves to a monogamous union is important. Yeah. Um, but I don't think you need state recognition to, to facilitate that. I think that that should be a personal matter. When it comes to religious institutions, again, this goes back to freedom of association. If a religious institution doesn't want to involve itself in gay marriage, it should be free not to. And the reason I think that is because as a communist, um, naturally, I, I believe that um, natural resources should be viewed as our common property. Um, so churches are no exception to that. They, they exist on land that should be regarded as collectively owned. Yeah. But I don't think that a re I don't think that a church denying gay people the right to marry within the boundaries of the institution I don't think that that's an oppressive act because people can get married elsewhere and why would you want to get married within <laughs> an institution that doesn't regard your lifestyle as being congruent with their philosophy yeah, their it, way of life it's been really strange because even over here it's actually like the vote is almost enforced in a way because it's going to be put on a um i think it's being put on a census bill anyway but like it's why, why is it so big i don't understand why it's becoming it, it, it's becoming part of that identity politics thing all, all over again and it's like this is an issue this has to be a mainstream issue and it's so important and i find it so irrelevant I agree. Um, my own theory when it comes to identity politics, why at this juncture in history, why is it all of a sudden so ubiquitous? Why is every news item centered around identity in some sense? Like, what is the origin of this? Um, in my estimation, um, I think there's two things at hand here. One, on the one hand, it distracts people from things that actually do matter in their lives. So if you get people excited about identity politics, the status quo is going to continue as is and the power elite are not going to be concerned because people are distracted with this petty nonsense on the periphery. Yeah. Um, another facet, however, is I think this brings to bear directly on capital, um, capitalist ideological self-justification. So um, bourgeois liberalism is one form of capitalist ideology and it's predicated upon the notion of a just meritocracy so the way that the bourgeoisie legitimizes itself within this ideological framework is to say that you can belong to any race any religion any sexual orientation and any gender and still make your way up the class hierarchy yeah so there's not going to be any barriers to you ascending from the proletariat to the bourgeoisie. Um, you're going to compete with each other on the basis of pure merit, right? Yeah. So if you have that outcome, then in their opinion, you can't criticize uh, the class structure per se because everyone has an equal opportunity to you know, rise from the lowest tiers to the highest rungs of the system. Well, I was, I was finding in America, it's interesting because, um, like, there's no not much of a class system because um, a poor person is really somebody who's a millionaire but temporarily embarrassed, isn't it? It's like it's not necessarily... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how they conceive of it. Whereas and, and in ask, the UK, there's a much stronger class division. Yeah, it has to do with class consciousness. If you ask... Ask an average American what class they belong to. Um, and the way that we define class in the United States is at odds with how a Marxist would. Marxists define class based upon one's relations to the means of production. And you and I already know what that entails. But uh, Americans define class in terms of income. So ask 
a minimum wage worker on the street of any American city what class they belong to, and they'll almost automatically respond that they're middle class, when yeah. in reality, they're among the lowest class. Yeah. Um, it's part of this prevailing ideology. As you said, in the United States, there are no classes. There's just the uh, bourgeoisie and then a bunch of temporarily embarrassed millionaires. <laughs> like, that's the way they see it. Um, and, and that's part of this ideology that I'm discussing, this uh, meritocracy. Um, they feel that if people can be convinced of the procedural justice of the class system, that is to say that it's devoid of racial discrimination or sexism or anything to that effect, then they'll agree to the terms of the game because then the game is viewed as fair. It's once you start criticizing the game itself, the class system per se, that's when things get dangerous. But identity politics doesn't call that into question at all. Yeah. It's it's arguing about um, the gender payment gap, the alleged gender payment payment gap, um, issues of sexism and discrimination and X, Y, and Z. So the bourgeoisie and the media are all too happy to dwell upon those news items because it doesn't threaten the system at all. If anything, to the, to the extent that we eliminate discrimination in the system, it's just going to, um, if anything, have more people start to defend it. You know, yeah. a lot of these um, SJWs and bourgeois liberals, you know, once they start winning these struggles, such as gay marriage, they start becoming more sympathetic to the to the government itself. Yeah. So um, if anything, it, it extinguishes radical sentiments. Well, um, I'm afraid we've run out of time, Michael, but thank you very much as always. Thank you, Charles. I appreciate you having me back. Thank you.